So this is a series we hope to do of special focus presentations to try to bring people art education and provide them information about the arts. But with that, Ted, talk to us. Well, first of all, uh, I want to thank Mac, Sharon, for, uh, for sponsoring this and uh, encouraging me and making me feel welcome here at the Art Center and all the, uh, the artists I've made friends with. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your friendship, uh, your input, and, uh, uh, and your art, of course. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Vince and uh, John and uh, Doug for uh, bringing the paintings over and helping hang them. I uh, couldn't have done it by myself. I mean, they, they, these guys are real pros, and I appreciate that. Uh, Larry, our, my video genius up there, is going to videotape this and uh, put out a CD, which I think will be valuable to the Art Center and maybe for me, too. I uh, also want to uh, uh, thank my wife, Anel, who came today, who has uh, put up with me for uh, almost 60 years now. Wow. So I'm uh, supposed to talk about abstract expressionism. Abstract expressionism is a recent term, but it has deep old roots. And I want to back up a little bit, first of all, and talk a little bit about art and, if I may use a metaphor, like call art a tree, a tree with many branches that go everywhere, all over the world, in all cultures, uh, to all, all people everywhere. They different interpretations, but the basic meaning is the same. It's, art is something that tries to make the human condition better. As a matter of fact, you can go all the way back into the caves in, uh, in, in France, where some of the first art was. Let me, let me uh, give you a little story here. Uh, pretend that you're uh, a caveman. All right, and what you have out there is uh, thunder crashing, lightning flashing, uh, rivers rising, rain, snow, all that kind of nasty stuff. But you know what's even more dangerous than anything of, of that? And that's the, the marauding tribe that comes over the hill, and there they are. And so what do you do? You can have two choices. You can stand and fight, and if you're big like me, why, maybe you'd stand and fight, except you also have the option of you can run and hide, all right? So me being the artist, am I going to stand there and fight? Boy, I'd rather go hide in my cave and, uh, and uh, put my enemies on the wall and hit them with spears and dots, or dare darts, uh, just like I do all the, uh, the uh, animals that I'm hunting. And did that, does that work? Well, maybe it does. Maybe it does. Uh, it makes things a little easier for your, your life if, if you can transfer all the evil, dangerous stuff onto a wall and throw darts at a wall rather than uh, going out there and doing the fighting yourself. Well, that, that's, just one, that's just one of the ancient arms of this tree of art. Uh, and I'm not gonna, I, of course, I can't talk about them all. But I do want to say just a little bit about one of the branches that uh, in France also, as a matter of fact, in Paris, and that was the Impressionists. You know, before that, uh, much of art was uh, done for the kings, the queens, the people who could afford it, even the popes, and uh, and you got very nice art from 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 religious backgrounds, of course, Sistine Chapel and Michelangelo, and you know. But I, I want to talk about the, uh, the Impressionists in, uh, in, in uh, Paris, because that's the first time, um, kind of the first time, that art actually was looked at with different kinds of eyes. Rather than exactly what was there, it had to be processed through an emotional quality and then transferred onto a canvas in a way that hadn't been done before. Well, this was very successful. 
sort of, and to some people, uh, unless your name was Van Gogh and you never sold anything. But the validity of that way of looking at the world through that art is phenomenal. It changed, it changed the world. It changed the art world. Paris was the, uh, the head of the art world for quite a long time. And then the Impressionists, uh, they didn't run out of steam, but New York was uh, something on the horizon over there that uh, suddenly came to life. And how did New York come to life? They called it uh, abstract expressionism. And abstract expressionism is no more than just the human being as an artist processing his inner feelings, putting it onto a canvas, and just what is on the canvas is symbolic of what the artist is and who the artist is. Uh, there, there's a phrase called abstract impressionism, which I, I almost uh, am more of myself than an expressionist, uh, because I, I don't do things like uh, Jackson Pollock or, or de Kooning or you know the, uh, the New York action painters. Now, when you say action painters, the, what, what went onto the, the canvas was the action of the artist using art principles, line, color, form, volume, you know, all of, all of all the principles, and that was his statement, and that was his, his symbolic being, all right? Not my, there, there's a lot that can be said about abstract expressionism, and I, I don't want to spend an awful lot of time on that. I'm just going to say that on this tree of art, abstract expressionism is kind of a little twig out there somewhere, and interesting and important but it's not the end all or be all of anything. It's just one of those other arms of art that you know about and that uh, you should know more about because it, it, it's kind of interesting stuff. Uh, when I start talking about uh, uh, these paintings up here, these are more abstract impressionism than abstract expressionism. I mean, it's not just splashy color all over the place. There's actually recognizable figures there. Now, but what I want to what I want to warn you about is that uh, in the traditionally, when Greek gods were done, Zeus was always a, a tall, stately gentleman in a long robe and a long beard, beautifully dressed and very regal looking. All the women were beautiful, decked out in their robes, because that was the uh, that was the Greek way of expressing things mod in, in modern terms. Uh, all of my figures are exactly not that. All right. <laughs> what, I, what I'm looking for in, in my figures are, are archetypes on what the figures meant uh, psychologically. Now, the Greek figures uh, themselves are common to all men everywhere. I mean, they, they, they didn't have a, uh, uh, you know, they didn't have a, a what, a, a claim on being the only thinking of that kind. Uh, it's our kind of, it's our Western thinking. A lot of our Western thinking came from there, if not all of it. But it, the background or the archetypes of that sort of thinking are common to all cultures, all right? And that's what I want to talk about today as I go through these, these pictures. And I'm going to t what I'm going to try to do is tell you what my impetus was, what my thinking was when I did these paintings. And uh, to give you, I won't go into them deeply, but just a little bit that might clear up some of the uh, imagery to, if you don't understand some of the imagery. I want to start with uh, Zeus, the king of the gods, or the, 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 the king of the gods. This is Zeus. All right, now, Zeus is usually this tall, stately figure with a, uh, with a very tame uh, thunderbolt in his hand. Well, Zeus is not that. And what I've said in this painting is Zeus is the thunderbolt. He is the power of destruction if he wants to use it. He uses it sparingly, but it's there for him to use. Okay, now, what does that mean in, in modern terms? To me, the, the ultimate destruction 
is just right around the corner. The same destruction that, that, that Zeus is exists today. And what do we call it today? We call it the hydrogen bomb, and we have actually used that a couple of times. But what happens is that it is so dangerous and so huge an idea it, physically in the world that we're not going to use it anymore, we hope. So Zeus in his thunderbolt, we have our thunderbolt, and the idea of ultimate power over, over the world is a very dangerous thing, and you better be very selective in how you use it. Okay, that was my thinking in, in, with Zeus. Now, you'd think that with that kind of power, uh, nothing could be stronger or more powerful than that. No, no, no. There is something more powerful than that. And that's this one over here. These are the more, which is uh, the Greek, uh, the, the fates, the three fates. Now, the three fates, uh, you have Clotho, who is the spinner, who spins the thread of life. You have Lachesis, who is the the assigner who assigns the life of a person. And then there's the one that you want to avoid at all costs, Atropos. Atropos is the one who snips the, the string or the web of life. All right? And you, you have to figure out which is which up there. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? How can that be more powerful than the atomic bomb? Well, it is, because if you, if you think about this for a moment, something that, that starts life and continues the lifespan and then kills at the end is called the life cycle. And everything has a life cycle. Everything. Plants, animals, the earth, the universes, everything has a life cycle. All right. So that, of course, is more powerful than any one superhuman power that any, any man or nation can hold. Okay, uh, that of course is Venus, uh, the birth of Venus, taken directly from, uh, from uh, 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 Botticelli. I, I figure if you're gonna if you're gonna steal stuff, you might as well steal from the best. So so you know there's the, that that can just uh, talk for itself. This one, this is uh, Pandora. Now usually Pandora is this beautiful young lady uh, who has been given all of the gifts by the gods, all of the wonderful beauty, any you know, all the wonderful things, but she was also given all of the nasty, yucky things, too, that were put into either a jar or a, or a box or a bottle, depending on the uh, version you read about. And she's always this beautiful young thing. Well, she's not a beautiful young thing because she represents all of us, and, and, and not just the women, but all of us, because we all have, we all have death in us. We all have starvation in us. And then we have all of these other things here, and you have to figure out which is which. But all of those things are human conditions that are very dangerous. But what is the one saving factor here? Hope. Hope was the one thing that was left over in the jar after she clap, clapped the, uh, the, the lid back on. Hope is, is the, the saving factor for humanity. Uh, there are others, of course, but there's my version of, of hope. This is Gerion, which is, which is uh, a, a figure out of uh, mythology. And uh, this is the vehicle that uh, you ride if you are a liar or a cheat or uh, uh, maybe if you're an artist. <laughs> if you, because this, is the, this takes you down to the seventh level of hell. In, in Dante's Inferno, but I, I, I sort of like the character. Not there's nobody writing him now, but uh, I, I sort of liked him anyway. And this is uh, Theseus slays the Minotaur, and of course the Minotaur is uh, uh, very famous uh, in mythology. 
especially by Picasso. Picasso did a lot of minotaurs, beautiful work, you know, graphic work. And the minotaur is uh, a huge beastly figure that shows the, the aggression, the hostility, the power uh, of men. And uh, the, the maze is a maze of life that we all go through. Okay, well now, how do you, how do you get, how do you go through life if you're this big, huge, beastly thing? You, you have to be clever, all right? You have to have friends who can help you do this. So uh, the slaying of the Minotaur symbolically is slaying the bestiality of us, the stupidity, and the sort of the gross uh, animalness of us, unless you have that string that leads you from the, from the maze out, okay? Uh, let's see, I, well, Artemis is the, 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 the female huntress of, of, of and I, I don't want to talk about her. She's, uh, she's very powerful, but actually what I wanted to get to was uh, uh, Mercury over here. Mercury is very famous and very important. Uh, Mercury, Mercury has, has various names. Uh, in uh, the, uh, the northern religions, he's called uh, Loki. Uh, American Indians called him Coyote. And this is, this is the force that causes change. There's, as soon as you think that you're on top of the world and nothing can, can get you and you're, you are absolutely on top of the world, what happens the next day? Your face is down in the mud, and you, you want to say, how did I get here? What happened? Or conversely, you're groveling around in the mud, and then something happens, you get a phone call, suddenly you're on top of the world. Well, who did that? What did that? Mercury did that. In the Middle Ages, Mercury's name was Mercurius, and he was used by the alchemist as the, the catalyst for the change in changing lead to gold. Now, changing lead to gold is a metaphor for what happens up here. When you, when you, w the process of changing lead to gold is actually the process of enlightenment. It isn't the physical change at all. It's actually enlightenment, and it's it's semi-religious term, but it's uh, an alchemical term also. What do we have back here? Let's see. Uh, well, you're going to have to turn around a little bit. I'm sorry. Uh, up here is Leda and the Swan. Uh, that's a famous uh, uh, allegory where Zeus seduces Leda, and uh, what's produced is uh, two sets of twins. One set is mortal, and one set is immortal. This is the this is one of the sets of the twins here, which I only, I only put in one set and you can decide whether they're mortal or immortal. This one is one of my favorites. Uh, this is the Oracle of Delphi. Now the Oracle of Delphi, I have two lions there, the lion rampant and lion sleeping, where, where two conflicting answers to problems can actually be presented. The, the quiet internal one or the violent, uh, aggressive one. And they, they, she wasn't the only uh, uh, prophetess in, in Greece. There were hundreds of them. They were all of, but she was probably the most famous one. But what this symbolizes to me is that, that logic and uh, clarity are not always the answer to things. Sometimes it has to be intuitive, internal, and kind of off the wall. And that's, that's, I think, what the oracle symbolizes to me. This, this is uh, the slaying of a Medusa. Uh, Medusa actually was a beautiful young girl at one time. And uh, Athena got, uh, uh, or no, Hera got very mad at her and uh, so uh, changed her into Medusa with the snake's head. So the, you know, the, the idea there is that if you go against a powerful figure, there are very serious consequences. All right, but yeah, and you need a you need a hero 
with, a lot, with enough sense and enough brains to figure out how to defeat you. Here is uh, Poseidon, the god of the sea. Uh, his trident, his trident, I think, symbolizes uh, three things. The head, the heart, and the gut. All right, three ways of looking at life. Uh, I put the, uh, the octopus in there because uh, I think the octopus is probably the most intelligent creature in the ocean. Uh, many people think that's so. Uh, he's like the human form with, with tentacles, with thousands of sensors on tentacles. And I, and I like the movement of the tentacles, so you know, there we go with that. Okay, I'm going to go on the other side of the room. <laughs> Pegasus is usually a white horse, right? Beautiful white horse with beautiful white wings. Very poetic. All right? And he's supposed to be. That, that he's the uh, like creative, poetic force of, of man. But do you know who his parents were? His parents were Poseidon and Medusa. Poseidon and Medusa. And one of the versions is that he was formed from a drop of uh, Medusa's blood. But to me, Pegasus is the, is the, the upsurging of the creative spirit. Except he's not white. He's, he's, he's much more colorful than that. And very difficult to uh, tame or to ride unless you've got uh, an okay from, from, uh, from the goddess, from Hera. This is... Uh, well, the centaur and the nymph, and, and uh, I think you can probably by now figure out what the symbolism is here. Uh, the centaur is, you know, like a human, human top and a horse body, which is once again the brutal form of humanity, all of the aggressive, brutal, hostile form of humanity, and the girl is, you know, the beautiful maiden in the, in the, uh, you know, in the in the meadow, in the in the in the brook, and he, you know, swoops her up and takes her off. All right, now what now what does that actually mean today? All right, uh, it means that, as you can see, this nymph has got many arms, and fights back terribly against that brutish force that is that is uh, clinging that has uh, abducted her. Well, what do you? What can you learn from that today? Control brutish force, and it can be done uh, in the way that that is best for you. Uh, that, that that was my thinking behind all of these. Over here, this is Lao Kun. Now Lao Kun. Uh, you probably are all familiar, you've seen pictures of this, this huge statue, uh, the marble statue with the two suns and the snakes all entwined, and how anybody did a sculpture, a huge sculpture of that, I, I, I'll never know. But anyway, Lao Kun was a, uh, he was a priest of Poseidon, in Poseidon's temple. But he did the unthinkable. Uh, he was supposed to say, stay chaste and do nothing but be the priest there uh, the, and do all of the, uh, the ritual that uh, Poseidon told him to do. Well, he did more than that. He got a girl in there and got her pregnant in the, in the, in the temple, and these two sons were born from that, that union. Well, Poseidon waited until the sons were half grown and then took revenge on him and sent the snakes and wrapped them all and, uh, and killed them both. Once again, now what, what is the message there? The message to me is that if you go against society, if you go against all of the structure of power, there might be really desperate circumstances from, from that. Okay? Uh, I have some more 
one, one of the ones that I wanted to, uh, to talk a little bit about, um, let me, I'll be right back. I'm going to take it off the wall in, in here and I'll, I'll bring it back. I wanted to bring this one because uh, uh, this is Apollo and his son chariot. Usually his son chariot is, is, uh, is carried by uh, you know, horses, but uh, there, there, are, there are versions where this huge eagle it, it carries the uh, sun chariot over the, uh, the, uh, the heavens. Now, Apollo was a very important uh, god in, uh, in, in Greek mythology. Because Apollo stood for brightness, sunshine, life, uh, intelligence, uh, logic, uh, all of the Greek higher uh, mental capacities, you know, like daylight, wonderful uh, ways of, of coping with life. All right. And there were many, many temples to Apollo. But as I've gone through these, uh, these paintings here, uh, like especially the, the Oracle of Delphi, there is another way of, of looking at life. And that's the intuitive way, the internal way, the, uh, the dream sequences, um, the internalized Bacchanalian. Well, I have Bacchus in the other room. And Bacchus is another symbol of approaching life from a different point of view. Not the logical, technological view that, 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 that Apollo stands for, but the internal, emotional way of, of approaching life. So if you put too much faith in, in Apollo, you're going to get a technological culture that is ignoring the internal, uh, kind of mystical, religious uh, way of, of, of looking at life. So that, that, that's why I brought that in here. Okay, now as I say, there are, there are a couple more pictures on the wall there which you can take a look at. Uh, one of the ones in there is uh, Hephaestus. Uh, I don't know, I want to talk just a minute about Hephaestus. Hephaestus is, was the uh, Greek god of the forge. Of, uh, uh, he is the creative spirit for Greeks and he can make anything. All right. he, uh, you know, he was famous for making weapons shields that, that were impenetrable, walls you couldn't cross, uh, you know, military sort of stuff. But he was more than that. He also could make statues that could speak. He could make furniture that could move where you wanted it to move by just telling it to move. He could make anything that, it, that was in your imagination. He was, he was that facile in, uh, in, in, in creating things. All right, now, Hephaestus is the creative spirit that all of us know about or, or, or have, have, have witnessed and, and experienced. And, I, and anything that you can think of that uh, themes, seems almost impossible, like talking statues. I mean, do we have talking statues today? We kind of do, don't we? I mean, the Japanese are making statues that could do all kinds of, you know, walk around the house and talk to you. There's the little things that walk around and clean your rugs for you that go all over. Okay, who made those? Hephaestus made those. But Hephaestus also made anything that you can consider the creative spirit of man. Okay. Uh, I want to, that, that's, that's about it. I mean, we're, this is not going to be too long. I did want to mention, though, that I also have Hephaestus here. This is Hephaestus. Okay, he's, here's his hammer, and here's the sword of art that, uh, uh, that we all are very familiar with. This is a, uh, a graphic novel that I wrote and illustrated. Now, when I say graphic novel, I don't know, calm down. There's, there's, no, there's no naked ladies in here. I don't know. But as, as you can see, the, all the pages are illustrated. And this is my background and my... Uh, of my art history. Uh, I have a master's degree in art from uh, Berkeley in uh, California. 
uh, in the late 50s, about the time that abstract expressionism was, was pretty much full swing. So I was, I was trained in that. And I've you know, diverged from that quite a bit in, in my career. But this is what happened to me in Berkeley and how I became an artist. Some of this is, is uh, kind of mystical sounding and magical sounding. But there is a mysticism and a magic in art that we all know about. All right. And I wanted to, I, I mentioned the, uh, the tree of, of art before. In the very final page, I have the tree of art. And the tree of art has many branches, like I said in the beginning. And it has, uh, let me see, what does it have? It has uh, imagination and divergence and pride and concentration, discipline, energy, independence, uh, being alone, and it's all wound up in this huge tree of art. All right. Anyway, and here I am on the back in 1958 when I still had, <laughs> when I still had dark hair <laughs> and uh, it was much thinner and not as uh, paunchy as, anyway, so if you would like a copy of this, these are available too. And uh, uh, feel free, uh, I just had some new cards printed up and uh, if you'll, if you, if you, I have a website with, with more artwork on it, a lot of pen and ink drawings and things like that. But uh, you know, does, that, does that look kind of familiar? Mm -hmm. I, I, put, I put my satyr on, on, on my card. So. <laughs> okay, so that, that's it. 40 minutes is, is, is just about right. So thank you very much. <laughs> any, any questions? Yeah, please. Ted, have you done series like this of any other subject matter? No, I haven't, but I, I'm thinking I, I might do a, uh, uh, a series on Wagner's uh, Ring Cycle uh, with the gods, with the, uh, the North gods, oh, the Norse okay. gods. Yeah. I, might, I might consider that. Some of these names are the same. They are, yeah, yeah some of them are. Odin rather than Odin. Thor, but yeah, same thing, yeah. You yes. Concentrated on Greek mythology. Do mm -hmm. you find, or have you found that Roman mythology kind of coincides? Oh yeah, sure. They just picked up the, the Greek and added a little bit to it. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Same principles so, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah. with um, brushes or knives or both? Or um, I see what looks like some palette knife work. Is it? Oh, there's a lot of pellet knife work. Yeah. A lot of pellet okay. knife work. Some of these are very thick, uh -huh. and they've uh, a lot of a lot of uh, physical uh, paint on, on on some of these. As you, well, you can see these are these are very thick, and uh, and th th this is one of the things about abstract expressionism. And I might I might mention this, and that's uh, if you are trained in that, uh, you're not afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes are your friend. Mistakes take you from one place to another. And when you're working on a painting, the painting gets to a place where the painting tells you what to do. And literally, it tells you what to do. You know, it's, it's not, you don't have control over it anymore. It's telling you what to do. That sounds a little strange, doesn't it? But it's not. It, it's, it's using the mistakes and not being afraid to make mistakes and letting the painting develop into itself. And if you want a definition of abstract expressionism, that's it. The painting expresses itself. Okay. What's your time period for creating all of these? Well, these were all done in Florida since I've been in Florida. So I think, I think it started in late 13 and then 14 and 15. So they're all, they're all recent. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. yeah. Taking years. <laughs> <laughs> John. Do you think there are gods in this that are contemporary today? Do I think there are what? Gods and myths of today. What would they be? That, that's a, a rather difficult question to, a, to, to answer, mainly because you make up your own gods, and, and you are responsible to your own gods. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, uh, you know, the, the Greeks had uh, like uh, naiads, uh, girls who, who protected springs and waterways. And uh, I, I, I thought about th Three Sisters uh, Springs. And I said, well, now, 
who are the three sisters? Who, who are the three sisters? Are, I mean, are they three different spring? You know who the three sisters are? The three sisters are three of the biggest, heaviest, grossest looking, what, what, come on. Manatees, absolutely. The three biggest manatees you can possibly think of. And why would they, why would they be the, the, the beautiful things that, that, what protects those springs? The manatees protect those springs. People, man takes care of the springs because he loves the waters and the, the manatees are there as a symbol of protection for those springs. So, you know, do we have naiads today? Do we have gods today? We have manatees today, a little different than the gods you were thinking of, though. Yeah. <laughs> the baby's asking a question. <laughs> when you start a painting and you start with a feeling, does it change as you get into the painting? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it, when I start a painting, it's, uh, it's amorphous, and, and, it's, and, and it just, it's just splotches of color everywhere. With, with a kind of, what did I do some, I do some uh, little uh, drawings, but I, I, don't, I don't stick to the drawings. I, I start with the, with the color and the form areas, and then all of a sudden it starts, it, it, it gives me hints. I need a little bit here, I need a little bit here, and a figure starts to evolve, and then more color here, and that's when the painting starts to take over and tell me what to do. So it, it's, it's a process of hit and miss, but with 50 years of, of practice, so. A lot of practice behind it. Yes, ma'am. I'm not quite sure how to phrase my question. It was sort of what he asked a moment ago. What are, how did the mythology of an ancient culture ground the people of that culture in their world? And are we missing that now? Yeah, I think so. The, the, the Greeks had literally hundreds of gods. They had gods for hallways, for, for archways, for hearths, for you, know, you name it, there was a god for it. And why did they do that? Because they considered it important and they wanted to conserve it and protect it. So how do you do that as, as, a, as a weak physical you know, human being? You need some help somewhere. So the gods, the gods that you assign to that help you in protecting and taking care of whatever it is. So the whole environment and everything is considered sacred. Absolutely, absolutely, okay. yes, yes, yes. And we should have that today. Mm -hmm. oh. John. Does that re religion survive in Greece? No one, no one practices this anymore, right? We're practicing uh, it right now, John. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, religiously, and they really believe it. Has it survived? I don't think so. Uh, well, it, I, I would say like the modern ecology movement is probably very close to the way the Greeks thought about the physical universe around them. Religiously, the Greek Orthodox Church took over after a while and, and it became, you know, like a conventional religious uh, belief. But the ecology movement and the concern for everything is, is pretty, still pretty alive today. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things against it, but, and it's hard work, but uh, I, I think it's, I hope it's still alive today. I hope we can all still work on it. You know, example, maybe, I, I, I'm just guessing, Catholic Church has a lot of patron saints for driving, for safety, you know, that sort of thing. So many parts of that did survive in a kind of distorted way. Well, that, 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 that's, <laughs> I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> do you listen to music when you paint? No. Oh, I'm taking it back. No, I do. I do listen to uh, some Beethoven, some Beethoven sonatas uh, quite a bit. Beethoven is one of those geniuses that uh, it's, it's, as a matter of fact, kind of, I consider it sort of like my painting where, where Beethoven plays things that are just absolutely, you'd think that it's just chaos and then all of a sudden it winds back down and, and it absolutely makes total sense. So, chaos here, total sense. <laughs> well, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I've enjoyed this and uh, 
maybe it'll help you, you know, look at the paintings though with a little different light now. So thank you all.